Uh, I have a bone to pick with this thing. Now, I know the embargo has dropped and there's probably 700 other YouTubers that are dropping their video on this, but uh, I'll put this into real world practice and I'm gonna show you a shoot and there's a few things I didn't like about this thing. But there's a lot that I love about this thing. I think they're gonna sell a lot of these, like literally a lot, because this pretty much is an A7S III, but cheaper. We got a lot to get through today. I'm gonna actually split this up into a few different videos because there's so many major categories that I really need to break down and give you more information. I don't want this video to be a one hour long video. So we're gonna break it down. Sony ZV-E1, this thing, is a gem. Let's get into it. What's going on, my friends? I hope you're all doing absolutely fantastic. We're gonna be talking a lot about the Sony ZV-E1 and the stabilization in this thing is insane when it comes to vlogging. This is definitely the best vlogging camera you can get, in my opinion, especially for the price because it's got that same A7S III rolling shutter performance. It's crazy good because remember when the uh, ZV-E10 sort of dropped and you know you had that really warpy rolling shutter because the sensor wasn't a really fast readout? Well, we all know the Sony A7S III sensor has a crazy fast readout. I mean, realistically, it pretty much has the same sensor of my FX6. I mean, what? What? Okay, we're gonna have to break this down into chapters as well. So look below, there'll be chapters because there's so much we need to get through today. So right from the start, you're probably thinking, ah, oh, I've heard it overheats. Well, yes it does. It was 33 degrees Celsius outside in direct sunlight. It only ran for 15 minutes constantly. But this next test, I did it inside. The inside temperature was 27 degrees and it ran for 37 minutes constantly. So this got me thinking, I was like, ah, 37 minutes, that's not much. But I decided to put it in this room. Now this room is a constant temperature of about say 22 degrees Celsius because I've got the aircon on just to keep myself nice and cool, keep my PC cool, and you know, just have a nice work environment. And this thing lasted well over an hour. I actually ran out of footage at 4K 25 frames per second. And you can actually see I filmed a thermometer so you could see the temperature. So it's just interesting that, you know, 22 degrees is sweet, but 27 degrees it overheats and only gets 37 minutes. So, you know, 24, 25 degrees, you might get 45, 50 an hour or something. It really just depends. But make sure you subscribe because I've got a full video dedicated to overheating with the Sony ZV-E1 against the a7 IV and a couple of other cameras. And you just have to remember, it is a smaller body and it has the ability to do 4K at 100 and 20 frames per second, but they're not giving it in this firmware update. The reason why they did that is because they can't have it the same as the A7S III, otherwise they would have to price it a lot different to what it actually is. But we all know that's probably not the only reason why they're holding it back right now, and that's probably because it would overheat in 4K 120 frames per second because it's such a small body, there isn't an internal fan, there's no active cooling there, there's only just passive cooling, and I don't think that uh, small body is going to be able to dissipate the heat as well as a larger body would, or like an FX6, FX30 with, you know, that internal fan. But don't forget, this is a full frame camera that offers you full frame 50 frames per second, and it's not cropped like the a7IV and the a7R5 as well. And it is much cheaper than the a7S III. Now in this video shoot with David, he's an IFBB bodybuilding pro and uh, it was a very hot day and that's why I'm wearing a singlet. I never ever usually wear a singlet when it comes Three, to photo two, shoots or video action. shoots, but it was a very hot day and I wanted to test 4K50 and if it would overheat by you know, recording normally, stopping the camera, turning it off, recording as I normally would in a video shoot and it did perfectly fine. It didn't overheat Three, two, at all one, within this whole shoot. In all honesty, you do not put in a screw with a hammer. What about a mallet? Can I use a mallet? This tool has a specific purpose. They built this specifically for vloggers. And obviously don't forget, Sony has dozens of other cameras you can actually choose if you are a professional videographer, interviewer, filmmaker, whatever you are, they can cater for you. This is catered for vloggers, so don't forget, this camera isn't intended 
to be a professional filmmaking camera. It's meant to be a professional vlogging camera, YouTubers, and all those kind of people who want to do travel videography. This is who this camera is actually intended to be for. Okay, first of all, we need to talk about the new menu system on the front. And I really like this setup because you can actually press record on the screen. You've got the face tracking, you've got zooms there. You can actually toggle between what kind of modes you want in terms of manual, you know, aperture priority, shutters priority. And you actually have cinematic vlog on the front, which is a completely different picture profile. We will be discussing this in a completely separate video because we really need to dive into exactly what this gives you. But essentially, this cinematic profile, it's the first I've ever seen on this kind of camera. It bakes in those top black bars and gives you a really nice wide aspect ratio, but it also bakes in a look. Like I said, it's a little bit complicated and it does a few different things that we need to talk about because there is a bit of sharpening there and it does bake in that color. Is the dynamic range a little bit different? We have to discuss that in a different video. And it only caps you to 25 or 30 frames per second in that mode as well. You can't do 50 or 60 frames per second. So we need to talk about obviously the recording frame rates. So essentially it's got the A7S3 sensor. So you would imagine it has 4K 120 frames per second, 1080p at 240, which it doesn't. It's got 1080p at 100 frames per second and it can only do 8-bit 420, unfortunately. At the moment, there might be a firmware update in the future that actually covers 10-bit and then also has 240 frames per second in 1080 but it can only do 4K 50 or 4K 60 frames per second at the moment. You can still do all I codec, which is fabulous because uh, you still get really high quality uh, footage, but you can also do H.265, which is your XAVCHS as well, which actually gives you that 10-bit codec as well. So you're still getting really high files from this with 4K 50 full frame, no crop as well. Now we all know the a7 IV that you're looking at right now doesn't have 4K full frame at 50 frames per second or 120 frames per second. Neither does the a7 R5. Now this one does full frame 50 frames per second or 100 frames per second in a future firmware update. Probably one of the standout features when it comes to a vlogging camera is the stability. They've got a new stabilizing system called Dynamic Active Steady Shot. Now essentially, all the new Sony cameras have your IBIS and Active Steady Shot now, whereas this one has your standard IBIS and Active Steady Shot. But there's a third option there where you can actually choose Dynamic Active Steady Shot. Essentially what I've done here is I've actually put this into Premiere Pro just to see how much it crops in. And uh, essentially I've scaled down the image and tried to make amber look the same size and it seems to be scaling down to about 69%. So you're getting about a 31% crop here on top of just regular IBIS. Now just for a little bit of context, this is the 16 to 35G lens and I will uh, turn on the dynamic active steady shot just so you can see the difference in the crop. Now this one is with active steady shot on with that same 16 millimeter lens of me vlogging full arm extension and this is with the dynamic active steady shot on full arm extension with the 16 millimeter lens here and you can see you can still get up to just the top a little bit of the bottom of my chest right there but there is still obviously quite a large uh, field of view and it's super stable which is great. Now also the one thing about that dynamic active steady shot, you cannot offer a clear image zoom on top as well because I'm assuming the processor has a lot of work to do when it comes to in-camera processing and live uh, view of that footage. So uh, unfortunately you can't do extra clear image zoom, but if you do bring it back to active steady shot, you still can do clear image zoom through that. Now another new feature we have to talk about is time-lapse. Now time-lapse generally was uh, like an interval thing where it takes a whole bunch of photos and then in post-production you sort of merge them together and you get that time-lapse video. Whereas this one, you can actually bake in the file into the camera, which is really great because if you are in a pinch and you just need a quick time-lapse, uh, you can literally go through this interval function in slow and quick mode, which is you know absolutely fantastic. And previously what I've done is literally just hit record on the camera in uh, SNQ mode and just put one frame per second. And essentially that gives you kind of like a baked in time-lapse, um, but this one is a dedicated feature for you know that time-lapse as well. 
Now, I guess the only downside of this one is that you can only do one second shutter. So if you'd wanna try and get some really nice slow light trails or even uh, a Milky Way shot, you can't do that with this one because it's only one second. You would have to boost the ISO crazily high, which obviously will bring in a ton of grain, but nonetheless, you can still get one second. And with the intervals, you can do one, two, three, four, or five second intervals. Now we have to talk about the focus. It does have the focusing system of the A7R5. What they try and say is that if a subject is fully turned, it will actually try to focus on the subject uh, as much as possible and keep, you know, priority on the face. If the person's turning and you can't see their eye, it kind of knows the shape through the whole AI software and essentially gives you, you know, tax sharp focus. Now you can see in this shot, I did have a little bit of focus issues when it came to this particular one, but obviously you can see it was underexposed. I forgot to change my ND filter on the front uh, because I had a six to nine stop. So I went and grabbed my two to five stop and once again, it was all slightly underexposed and was focusing on his arm a little bit, his hand, his band, that kind of thing. And then uh, I adjusted it for the next one and the focus was perfectly fine. So that was just a little bit of user error, but I felt like the focus was really, really good in bright situations. When it came to that really dark situation, maybe it's because of his dark complexion against the dark background, that could have been a little bit of an issue there. Now, when it came to the rest of the shoot, it did seem like the focus was pretty decent. I did film at f1.4 with the 50 millimeter f1.2 lens, which I never do. I never film that wide open. I just wanted to test how good this autofocus system was, and it did seem to keep up quite nice. And I tested the autofocus here directly on Joanna's eye and it stuck the whole way through. This shoot was perfectly fine, especially in well-lit situations, very tacky. Now, when it comes to the mic system, a lot of Sony cameras don't obviously have really good internal mics for the reason that they don't really need it because you've got that multi-interface hot shoe, which you can put the ECM B1M, which I love. Pretty much one of my favorite microphones of all time because it's no cords. You can put it into auto uh, microphone and picks up quality, quality audio. But this one seems to have a similar or the same system from the ZV-E10 as well here. Now this is the microphone quality that's coming directly out of this camera in pretty much my same studio area and I am pretty much an arm's length away from the camera. So this is like your vlogging sort of scenario with the in-camera microphone and we'll put the ECM B10 on top and see what that sounds like. So obviously the ECM B10 is a shotgun microphone, so it's picking up the polar patterns directly in front of the shotgun mic. Whereas I suppose the uh, the in-camera microphone is more of an omnidirectional, so it picks up pretty much all around. So it's not going to be as good as the ECM B10, or obviously as good as this one, where you can get as close to the microphone as physically as possible. Now, when it comes to audio, we do also have a 3.5 audio jack in on the left-hand side here, but then we've also got a headphone out as well, so you can actually monitor your audio, which is obviously really, really good. Probably just saw what's right next to it. Yes, I know. It is a micro HDMI. They've gone back to that mainly for the fact of size, because this is a very small body, and for the fact that vloggers don't need to have a monitor and don't get all your knickers in a knot because vloggers uh, essentially are kind of YouTubers in a way and uh, some YouTubers do use monitors but you got that flip screen that faces towards you. You wouldn't need a monitor. Most people who need monitors are professionals who need to start recording for you know paid gigs and all those kind of things and micro hdmi you still can use that with a micro hdmi to full size hdmi uh, adapter and while we're there we may as well talk about the one card slot so it's only got just a regular card slot so sd card v90 cards will give you pretty much every feature v60 card will hold you back on those uh, 50 frames or 60 frames per second all like codec but you only have one card slot and you know, a lot of us only use one card anyway, record to one card, and um, that's still perfectly fine, and as long as you don't get Lexar cards. <laughs> and now I know the A7S3 users are going to get a little bit angry at this one, but uh, it's got variable shutter. 
So essentially, variable shutter is an incredible feature that if you are filming screens and you do have a flicker rate that's not matching up with your frame rate or shutter speed, this is where you can dial in 50.1. 50.2, 50.3, you can really dial it in and get zero flicker on screens and phones, which is really good. And it's an amazing professional feature. And to have it on a vlogging camera, I mean, that's awesome. And I know I know the FX3 and A7S3 people don't have that yet, which hopefully will come in a future firmware update. But uh, Sony do seem to love putting the brand new features in brand new cameras, so. That's their strategy, and if that's what works for them, it's what works for them. And in saying that as well, they do have the focus mapping. And I know a lot of people don't use focus mapping, but I use it a lot because if you see a lot of my top-down shots, putting the camera up there and trying to rely on manual focus and just dialing it in and seeing if it's in focus with uh, peaking, sometimes you can't nail that edge perfectly. And, or I've customed it to the trash can button and literally hit it and the focus map comes up and I can physically see, if it's clear, I can physically see what's in focus. And it's saved me so much when it comes to trying to get things in focus. It's actually a really good feature if you are trying to film products and stuff. And a lot of uh, content creators out there will be filming products. Now this one, get this one, right? Framing stabilizer. It's the newest feature where essentially you put the camera down, it will crop in, but it will keep you in frame the whole time. So it'll actually digitally move and track you. It's pretty much just like tracking yourself in post-production and trying to move the camera with your movements. Where can I see this happen? Now this could be good for people who are obviously content creators and don't want to have to try and track in post-production and move along with the character. This, if you are an instructional personal trainer, if you're an instructional uh, just educator, you can literally set the camera down and just let it track you for a little bit. I mean, that's pretty cool. At least you don't have to spend time in post-production to be doing that. So. This does save a lot of that time, and essentially that's what the feature is for, is just to try and save a bit of time. And I mean, some beginners don't even know how to do that. So that is a really big plus for this thing. Okay, lastly, we need to talk about one thing that I absolutely love, but I'm not sure why it's not in any other camera at the moment. And that is this little flap here. Essentially, it flips out. So you can put a dummy battery in there with a cord, thread that cord in, and essentially run this through V-mount battery. With my A7 IV, with my FX30, I actually have to keep that flap down so I can have a dummy battery and run the cord out. Whereas they actually had you know this thing, but then they started to remove it. But I use a lot of dummy batteries so I can actually use V-mount batteries, and uh, this gives you that option, but when it comes to vlogging camera, I don't think people are gonna be rigging this out as a cinema rig, except for me. It's, I'll definitely be rigging this one out. So anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. That'd be absolutely amazing. Subscribe to my channel if you want to be notified because of the whole bunch of other videos we're gonna be diving real deep into this camera and what it has. Um, and some of those features like picture profile, the object tracking, uh, and also the stability as well. I really wanna go through that and compare it with the other alpha cameras. But uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. All right, let's get it.